Thank you so much, team, and uh, thank you for the warm uh, welcome. It's great to be with you, and uh, uh, so so not in these circumstances, but uh, Daryl's doing well, and uh, when I chatted with him, he was uh, constantly praying because he knows who's up here today, so, <laughs> so, so uh, we've been uh, great friends for a long, long time, so we knew far too much about one another, so I, I know he's nervous about what I'm going to say about him, uh, which today will be nothing, so you can just send that back to him that, uh, of course, his wife's here this service, so you know, I'm a little bit limited anyway. So good to be here. Um, my wife and I just moved, and uh, we moved out of uh, uh, the big metropolis of Whitby into a littler metropolis of Myrtle Station. So some of you who go north uh, know where that is, and uh, we're just south of railway tracks. Coffee's always on, so feel free to drop in. Not, but <laughs> thought, thought I should say something warm and fuzzy like that. So we're getting to know our neighbors, right? And so we get, uh, we, we get seeing one of them down the laneway, and uh, he waves us in to come and, and chat. And so we do that. And so my wife and I are there, and uh, I don't know how this leaked out. And believe me, um, they found out that I'm a pastor. So usually that's a, a conversation stopper. It's just, it's just not what I lead with ever. So. Uh, we, we, we talk, and, and he, he's like, so you're a pastor. He said, I haven't been in church for a while. So this, this, uh, this older Dutch guy, of course, my wife is of that heritage as well, so they have this immediate like, Dutch bond going on. And, and so I, I'm a reverend. He said, reverend, you know, I've got a lot of vices. I'm like, okay, good, where's this going? Uh, and then he said something. Uh, he said, I haven't been to church for a while. He said, you know what, I... And this is right out of the blue. He said, you know, I'd, I'd probably rather be in hell. Mm. Where's this going? Now, usually I'm quick to say something. Um, that time I just stopped. I, and I'm sure the Lord was just shutting my mouth. And, and then he said, you know, I've got lots of friends, and they're sinners, and I, I think I want to be with them and have fun rather than be in heaven. Now, I... I saw, I mean, the conversation went on to other things like cows or whatever, but, but I thought about it later, and I, and I really began to, to think through in my own heart, like, how many people are living life really honestly feeling that way, and I, I suspect even Christians sometimes um, think, you know, I wonder if it'd be more fun and better if we were just allowed to do all that. Like, you got to be real if you're going to be talking with people, and so... I appreciated his honesty. Now, it's going to lead to other conversations for sure, because when I left, um, I said, you know, do you mind if we have a conversation about God sometime? Oh, yeah, that'd be great. You know, so, so the, door, the door's open, and we'll, we'll go ahead and, and do that. But, but it just strikes me, like, wh what do we got when we got God? What, what do we have? What do, do we win or do we lose? What, what is it? What's going on? And, and I, know, I know ultimately you, you think we're going to win, but, but is it like a lifetime of losing in order to get there, um, the, um, the psalms are pretty incredible. I, we'll get back to that conversation. The psalms are a tell-it-like-it-is group of writings. I mean, the Bible generally is that anyway. So, so if you open it up, if you've never been through it before, just start, start reading. Um, and you'll, you'll see there's just stuff in there. You're like, really? That happened? And, and what kind of a God is this? And what kind of people did he choose? And... They're all flawed, it seems, and, and yet somehow God works. And, and, and so there's something very real about the Psalms. It's an honest view from the heart of God's followers. You, you need to recognize that, that these, these are poets, and, and they're not like light poetry. I mean, they, they have meter to them. It, um, there's a pattern to how these are formed, and depending on who's writing, um, uh, you, you can identify who, who the writer is based, based on their, their previous um, writings, and, and, and yet they're so real and, and they're not meant to be the top 50 of anything. They're not built for popularity. They're not built so that everybody be running to them. Um, they, they just happen to view how they view God, and, and, and you, so you get a, a taste of that. I'd really encourage you to read through the Psalms. Not all of them are, are, are lovely and pretty. You're, you're going to hit the psalmist as they really are, but you're going to get a view into God. You're going you're to catch him. You're going to get a sense. So what we want to do is catch him today. And I, and I want us to change the conversation about, about what you don't have when you have God to what you do have. 
Let's talk about that together. Let's, let's converse with one another about that. Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid of? Wow! I mean, I just love that, that sentiment. Let's, let's talk about three things. When you have God, and so the overall statement is this, you have a boatload of confidence. I mean, you just, you just, you just know stuff. You, you, you got somebody with you. Just think of David and Goliath and, and, and what he stood there um, with. And we'll get, we'll get back to some of those neat stories. He's, uh, the psalmist says, light, salvation, and refuge. Now, when I say light to you, uh, it sort of becomes a passive thing for us. Uh, when, when we go home, we flick on the light. When, when, we, when we go traveling, we look for street lights. Or if not, if the moon's out, I mean, that, if it, we turn on our headlights. And, and darkness flees when, when that happens. You know, so, but, but to us, it's a little bit of a passive deal. Um, but but not, not to the psalmist. To him, it was a real thing. He is light. He pursues darkness. It, it's a very active word. Salvation. He got saved from something. I, I was... I was Dead, and he rescued me. I mean, there's, there's nothing passive about any of this. You're my refuge. And, and he's talking in the middle of people pursuing him, that one is death, that one is destruction. So these are very real and powerful terms. I uh, spent a lot of time in India uh, over the last 10, 15 years, and, and, uh, and one, of the, one of the guys came to visit us. When, when Indians come, generally, they, they want to see some things. So you know, on, on their top three list is, can we go see Niagara Falls? So we traipsed out to Niagara Falls, and, and I remember V.J. Rao uh, was, was looking over, over the falls, and, uh, and of course there's signs, don't climb over and stuff. I just think those are the silliest signs on the planet, duh. <laughs> but they're there, so I guess people can't read or, or wonder what it'd be like to fall over them. I don't know. Um, so he stood there and, and just watched the tons of water flowing. And you know, my knees go weak even describing it. I mean, I just, just feel that stuff. And then, and then we, we got our, our parkas on and, and raincoats and went underneath the falls. Have you ever done that? And in, in, in underneath there, and, and the water just pours over you in these caves. And, and the sound is deafening. And the, the, so Vijay was just there mesmerized. And so I, I imposed what I thought he was thinking um, it was time to go, and, and I called him, and he just stood there. And then I thought, um, I bet you, I bet you, he's wondering about how fresh the water is, and how how all of that fresh water coming from India, um, so many places don't have anything like that. As a matter of fact, we bathe in more fresh water than um, many people will ever see. And so I asked him. I said, Vijay, is that is that uh, is that it? He said, no. He said, that, that is amazing, um, all that fresh water. But he looked at me and he said, the power. And it transfixed him. And so when the psalmist is saying light, refuge, salvation, the psalmist isn't talking about something passive. He's talking about an active, powerful force. What have you got when you've got God? Well, you've got a boatload of confidence. Think of David and Goliath. Um, David stood there um, with nothing but a slingshot, and, and he told Goliath, you, you come with a sword and a spear, I come to you. Remember what he said? Representing the armies of the living God. I represent Yahweh of hosts. And what we got to understand is that, that he represented Yahweh of hosts. We say, oh, okay, that was, a, yeah, we represent. No, no, no. He didn't represent him, period. He was appointed representative of Yahweh of hosts. He had a job to do. Christians, you and I, not just represent We've been appointed to represent Yahweh of hosts. We represent his power and his strength, his refuge and his, his salvation. We, we represent that. We stand against the dark forces of this world. You do. From the youngest to the oldest, you do. Just an amazing thing I... I, I had a chapel, um, and so with the Toronto Marlies, uh, they meet at the Rico Center, and so I head down and, and catch guys after practice and, and after games, and, and, you know, every once in a while we'll have a, a chapel, they call them really just small groups of guys who happen to 
have nothing else to do, so they show up. And, and, and so it's, it's not a highlight of most of their, of their days. And so this, this one time, we had, we had a few guys gather around. We met in, meet in the press room, which is way back in the belly of the RICO Center. So we're sitting around a table, and, and I usually bring a, a scripture thing with a back portion that they can fill in blanks. And, and, and can I say this lovingly? It's like spiritually talking to five-year-olds. They come into the room, most of them, they know nothing. So this is what happened to be the story of David Goliath. So they're sitting around, and I, and I get them to take turns reading it, and, and, and so we go through the story. And I said, so, so guys, who would you rather be? Who, who brought the most to the table? So the one guy who was the Marley's top scorer last year, he said, well, to start off with, I was going to pick Goliath. He had everything. So I said, yeah, he did. Look, look at all. He was a sword spear. He was giant. Yeah, I wanted that. So I said, is that who you'd want to be? He goes, turns out, no. Turns out, I'd rather be David. I go, why is that? Well, he had everything. And for the first time, probably acknowledged that that power came from somewhere else. That God was something very unique, very different. That in spite of everything that other people might have, he had Yahweh. People, you know who you've got, right? You know who you've got, right? Like, th this is, this is a, a game changer, this is. This is a, a totally different passage of scripture because you have God and you've got stuff. I have a friend in in India, and we'll start this story. This will sort of linger through the rest of the, the, the message. But uh, his name is Paul Doss, and, and Paul, uh, bless, bless his heart, had a heartbeat for kids and families. And he, he wanted to, to have a property where he could host and, and bring kids and families and, and share the gospel with them, give the kids a good time, give them a bit of an escape from, from their everyday. And, and he was praying about this. He finally saw a plot of land. Now, this plot of land was, was desert. It was, there was nothing on it. I mean, literally, scrub was there, and, and, and nobody was sleeping or living on it. Now, you know in India that's unusual. If there, if there is a blank spot of property, there's somebody camping on it. It just is part of, of what is India. And so, and so this place was vacant. And so he went to the magistrate. He said, what's up? He said, I'd like that property. The magistrate said, I cannot give you that property. Nothing grows on it. It's a desert. And by the way, it's filled with demons. Magistrate. So all of a sudden, this, this becomes something very different. Paul said, I want it. You can't have it. I want it. You can't have it. Paul said, tell you what, if I find water, you'll give it to me. When you have God, you've got confidence. Boatload of it. By the way, that should leak into our prayer life, right? You have to ask. He wants you to ask. We could fly off into that. We won't. So the magistrate finally said, okay, if you can find water, you can have the land. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Well, that strikes me as a little bit unique just out of the gate. Um, this one thing I ask, if you could ask God for one thing, what would that be? Let me help you. I, mortgage gone would be nice. And once it's gone, maybe a a nicer place. It was just a starter place. Now, now we move on. The kids are growing. And by the way, the car we're driving, Lord, it's one thing I asked. Okay, now we're two things. And, and, and so when, when that car gets, you know, upgraded, it, maybe, maybe a place north. A place out of here where I could just sort of escape for a little while. That seems righteous to me. And, and by the way, if it's the same prayer, it could be the very same prayer. 
Maybe a place south, too. Now, what, what's the issue? What is, no. No, I know, I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm just helping you out here, because one thing can lead to another. But, but this one thing, and, and of all the things I thought of, and some of them were way more righteous than that, you know, I'll give to the missionaries. It's one thing I ask, and, and here's the, what he asked for. To be in his presence and experience his wonder. Because when you have God, you have a shockingly new purpose. It's, it's a transforming new purpose. It's not just the, the mundane, and, and I think back to my, my Dutch neighbor friend who, who was thinking about the stuff he'd missed. Stop it. We have an entirely different reason for walking this earth. We have a shockingly new purpose. And my purpose now is to be in his presence, to experience his wonder, enjoy God with everything that he's got. I want to see him. That's it. That's it. My friend Paul took his uh, drilling equipment. Actually, he hired a drilling company to come to the, to the barren land. And uh, India, as, as happens, uh, anything goes on, you draw a crowd. And so here, when a drilling company comes and starts to drill in this demon-possessed land, guess what? People came. People came from everywhere. And, and so they, they gathered, and they, they chatted, and find, found out what on earth was going on. And then they, they started laughing and debating and talking about this idiot throwing his money away on this. And, 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 and so the crowds began. And as the crowds began, of course, um, there were little arguments and, and little flurries of issues. And so naturally, the police came. So now you've got a party. Now you've got people like talking and yelling, and, and, and Paul's in the middle of it, and they're mocking him, and they're laughing. And, and, and he didn't tell me all they were saying, but I can only imagine. So in the middle of all of this, the noise, the din, the foreman of the drilling company came and said, Paul, doesn't look good. Do you want us to continue? He was starting to feel Paul's humiliation. Paul gathered himself around those that were supporting him and created kind of a quiet place in the middle of all that. And, uh, and he bowed his head and prayed. And he told me he didn't have any, he didn't lay out a prayer, he hadn't pre prepared a prayer beforehand. It was, here's what he uttered to the Lord. Lord, you've brought me this far, you brought me too far to turn back now. Amen. I had planned it. I wouldn't even recommend you copy that prayer. That's not your magic formula prayer. But as soon as he's prayed that, he, he felt God's peace. And he looked up at the foreman and he said, keep drilling. And then he went back to taking the abuse and, and all, all of that kind of stuff. But here's his acknowledgement. The Lord had brought him that far. It wasn't him. The Lord had brought you to this point, so there's no going back. Whatever's ahead, there's no going back. Whether, whether it hits water or doesn't hit water, Lord, you've brought me. We're here because you brought me. There you are. You're here now, today, because God, in his sovereignty, has brought you here. And you've come too far. He's too real. He's too big. He's too powerful. When you have God, you have shockingly new purpose. And your purpose now, whatever circumstance you're in, is to represent Yahweh of hosts. Beautiful. Psalm 27 13 and 14 says this, I, remember, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Wow. Take heart. I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Just stop there for a minute. Let me just... Say this, when you have God, you experience him now. 
and let's acknowledge heaven is real. You, you, will, you will be transformed. You will have new bodies to be able to handle. Well, you'll have new everything. Spirit will become alive and able to take what, what God's got for you. And, and in his presence, you'll have a new form, somewhat recognizable. But you'll, you'll be brand new. And you'll be able to catch his, his, his wonder full on, the, the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit together. And with all of their brilliance and whatever that means in terms of his power and strength, we'll be able to take it. And, and that, that's for every believer. So, is there something to look forward? Oh, man. So we're going to acknowledge that. But let's acknowledge this too. So is God's presence now. Let's acknowledge this. Please, let's talk about this. This, this, this presence is not just for then. This is for now. His, his power is for right now. You are built right now to accept him, Jesus Christ, and his presence he calls you a tabernacle. You're the place where he lives. When you talk to God and you know Jesus Christ, you know who you talk to? Talk inwardly. Don't just look up there. No, no. He's here. He's never very far away from us. So please, he gets it. He knows what you're going through. He's with you. You don't have to call on him and he'll rush to get you. He's not, he's not like me. You know, dial, him, dial me in and maybe I'm in the vicinity. No, no, no. Jesus, yes. The response comes from inside. Your spirit has been transformed already. You have him. He is here. Let's adjust our thinking accordingly. So if you, if, if you think that, that just, just by you want to you drink more, smoke more, do whatever you want more, and, and, and give this up, no contest. No contest. His presence is real. Paul went back to arguing with with those who were taunting him and trying to explain why he was doing what he was doing. In the middle of all of that hubbub, there was screams from the other side of the property, and Paul turned around just to see the workers rush to cap the flow of water that was coming out. In an instant, life was different. Just like that, it went from death to life. Just like that, he had the property. Just like that, things began to grow. Just like that, God's name meant something different in that community. Just like that, lives were changed. Not because they made any formal decision, but because Yahweh made his presence known. Doesn't happen like that for everybody. But it will happen somehow, some way, for those who know Christ at just the right time. Heaven is real, but let's realize so is God's presence. Verse 10 and 11. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Fourthly, when you have God, you have a home. When you have God, even if mother and father have forsaken you, now that can mean all sorts of things um, in this context, but some of us, that happened early in life. And maybe not physically, but, but you just felt rejection from people that loved you the most. Maybe, that's, maybe it happened later in life. So when you've thrown your life towards, has, has turned around and thrown it back at you. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's totally different. Maybe your expectations in life haven't been met and you find yourself alone. Can I say this? In North America, the term loneliness is very rich. We are a very lonely people. I forget all the stats, but it's overwhelming how many of us feel and sense loneliness. Even though father and mother reject you, you're there. That's powerful. Rob Hayes, yep. Nobody likes you, everybody hates you. 
Yep, I'm here. Okay. In an instant, that changes everything. We can live in crowded places. As a matter of fact, you know, sitting in this, this crowd can, can either mean isolation or it actually can mean community. Guess what? God intends it to be community. God has called us together family, and, and that means there's a mutual love and respect and an ownership and a dependence and interdependence and vulnerability with one another that we don't get anywhere else. See, Jesus hasn't forgotten his commitment to, even if father and mother forsake you, if you're in community with Christ, you have a family. You realize when God answers prayer, the things that you've been asking for, 99.9% .9 of the time, he's got a person in mind to come and help you. That's how God works. So if you're in community, you're putting yourself right in the path of God's blessing. You get that? Read 1 Corinthians. It talks about community. It talks about the breadth and the life that's there. Others can reject you. You will have a path to keep you safe. You have a purpose. And this, this path to keep you Hey, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to go after you. As the psalmist says, it means that, that in the middle of that, I've got a spot for you. I'm guiding you through that. Paul Doss uh, enjoyed that moment, but what happened in the months to follow was trees began to grow and grass began to grow. And they began to plant vegetables and, and fruit trees. So if you go there now, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't, you'd think this story is absolutely insane. It's like, not this place. This place, because it was the source of so much, became the envy of the area. It became, and so kids were invited to come, and so there's a cabin there now so kids can stay overnight, and family camps, and, and he has married, and people weekly are coming to know Jesus Christ out of that place. Right, right now. Paul can't handle it anymore. He does so many other ministries, so he's hired people in order to manage that, and, He's on to different things. That was his vision. That's what he knew. He's not, he wasn't surprised. He's, yep, that's what I saw. He wasn't surprised at that, but here's what he wasn't expecting. The government decided to put a brand new airport, and they put it just up the road from him and paved that old road to something that was to carry hundreds of thousands of cars. And so they put a simple sign up as to what they were doing. And so now it has a city-wide impact. And that property went up a thousandfold in price. He wouldn't have had a clue. God did. He gets it. He gets you, he understands the path and, and the things that are, are besetting you and, and all those challenges, the voices and your circumstance, maybe you're not alone, he's got you on a path. In the middle of that, he is going to and is already showing his strength, guaranteed, you will make it, you have a purpose in the middle of your stuff. You have something to walk. I uh, suggest that today we change our conversation a little bit. Our goal is to change the conversation from I'd rather be in hell to really? Here's my experience. Something you ought to know. And here's the deal. People are consumed with what's going to go wrong. Donald Trump, Hillary. <laughs> Great. Justin Trudeau, great. But don't make any mistake. God is in the middle of all of that stuff. So let's change the conversation. You are the representative of the living God. And if you have him, you've got it. Let's pray. Father, our joy today is to gather in your presence to recognize your power and your strength. And as we prayer our hearts for, for communion, as we gather around the Lord's table and celebrate your 
death and burial, but the power of the resurrection evident in everything that we know and see. That's what we're celebrating in just a moment. And we thank you. And we pray that your face would shine upon us and keep us. And may your peace guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's in his powerful name we pray.